As long as human beings have been around, I could imagine that they've noticed that offspring tend to have traits in common with the parent. For example, someone might have told you, hey, you walk kind of like your dad, or your smile is kind of like your mom, or, or your, your eyes are like well, your, one of your uncles or, or your grandparents. And so there's always been this notion of inherited traits. But it wasn't until the 1800s that that started to be studied in a more scientific way with Gregor Mendel, Mendel the, the father of genetics. But even then, even Mendel, who was starting to understand the, the mechanisms of, or he was trying to understand how inheritance happens, and he even could start to breed certain types of things, even he didn't know exactly what was the molecular basis for inheritance. And the answer to that question wasn't figured out until fairly recent times, until the mid 20th century, not until the structure of DNA was established by Watson and Crick. And their work was based on the work of many others, especially folks like Rosalind Franklin, who, who essentially provided the bulk of the data for Watson and Crick's work, Maurice Wilkins, and many, many, many other folks. But it was really the, the structure of DNA that made people say, hey, that looks like the, mo that looks like the molecule that, that's storing the information. And just to be clear, DNA wasn't discovered in 1953. DNA did, was discovered in the mid-1800s. It was this kind of this, this molecule that was inside of, 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 of nuclei of cells. And for some time, people said, oh, maybe this could be the, a molecular basis of inheritance. You, know, you could imagine what, what you would need to be a molecular basis of inheritance. It would have to be a molecule or a series of molecules that could contain information that could be replicated, that, that could be expressed in some way. But it wasn't until 1953 where this double helix structure of DNA was established that people said, hey, this looks like, this looks like our molecule. So first, let's just talk about the structure here. And then actually, we'll talk about where this name, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, comes from. And then we'll talk a little bit about why, why the structure lends itself well to something that stores information, that can replicate its information, and that could express its information. We might go in depth on the expression of information in future videos. So this structure right over here, and this is a visual depiction of a DNA mo molecule, you can view this as kind of a twisted ladder. It has these two, I guess you could say, sides of the ladder that are twisted. That is one side right over there, and then it is another side. There is another side right over here. And in between, in between those two sides, or connecting those two sides of that twisted ladder, you have these rungs. And these rungs are actually what, where the, the information, the genetic information, is, I guess you could say, stored in some way. Because these rungs, it's a sequence of different bases. And when I say bases, that, you know, say, wait, this says acid. Why are you saying bases right over here? Well, the word deoxyribonucleic acid comes from the fact that this backbone is made up of a combination of sugar and phosphate. And the, the, the sugar that makes up the backbone is deoxyribose. So that's essentially the D in DNA. And then the phosphate group is acidic, and that's so where you get the acid part of it. And nucleic is, hey, this was found in nuclei of cells. It is nucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid. But it, it's not, it, it also, it, it, is, it is actually mildly acidic all in total, but for every acid, it actually also has a base. And that base, for, those bases form the rung of the ladders. And actually, each rung is a pair of bases. And as I said, that's where the information is actually stored. Well, what am I talking about? Well, let me talk about the four different bases that make up the rungs of a DNA molecule. So you have adenine. Uh, adenine. And so, for example, this part right over here, this, this, this section of that rung might be adenine. Maybe this right over here is adenine. This right over here. Remember, each of these rungs are made up by uh, it's a pair of bases. And that might be adenine. Maybe this is adenine. And uh, I could stop there. Well, maybe I'll do a little more adenine. Maybe that's adenine right over there. And adenine always pairs with the base thymine. So let me write that down. So I, adenine pairs with thymine. Thymine. So if that's an adenine there, then this is going to be a thymine. If this is an adenine, then this is going to be a thymine. Or if I drew the thymine first, well, I'll say, OK, it's going to pair with the adenine. So this is going to be a thymine right over here. This is going to be a thymine. If I were to draw this, this would be a thymine right over here. 
Now, the other two bases, you have cytosine, which pairs with guanine, or guanine that pairs with cytosine. So guanine, and we're not going to go into the, the, the molecular structure of these bases just yet, although these are good, good names to know, because they show up a lot, and they really form kind of the code, your genetic code. Guanine. Guanine pairs with cytosine. Guanine and cytosine. Cytosine. So actually, if this is, let's say there's some cytosine there, let's say cytosine right over here, maybe this is cytosine, maybe this is cytosine, maybe this is cytosine, this is cytosine, hey, maybe this is cytosine, then it always pairs with the guanine. If we're talking about, so let's see, this is guanine then, then this will be guanine, this is guanine, this is guanine. I actually didn't draw stuff here, but this is guanine. I didn't say what these could be, but these would, th these would be made of pairs of, they could be adenine-thymine pairs, and it could be adenine on either side or the thymine on either side, and they could be made of guanine-cytosine pairs, where the guanine or the cytosine is on either side. Actually, just to make it a little bit more complete, let me just, let me just color in the rungs here as best as I can. So that's, those are guanine, so they're going to pair with cytosine, pair with cytosine. Pair with cytosine. And when it's drawn this way, you might start to see how this is essentially a code. The order of which the bases are, are, are I guess, the, the order in which the, we have these, the sequ or the sequence of these bases, essentially encode the information that make you, you. And you could debate, well, how much of it is nature versus nurture? And when people say nature, you know, it's literally genetic. And that's, that's an ongoing bait. An ongoing debate, but it does code for things like your hair color. Uh, you, you know, when you see that your smile is similar to your your parents, it is because that information, to a large degree, is encoded genetically. It can affect. It affects a lot of what makes you you, and actually, not even just within a species, but also across uh, across species. What, what humans have more genetic material in common with other humans than they do with, say, a plant. But all living creatures, as we know them, have genetic information. This is the basis. By by which they are passing down their actual traits. Now, you might be saying, well, how much genetic information does a human being have? And the number will, will either disappoint you or, or you might find it mind-boggling. Mind the human genome, the human genome, and every species has a different number of base pairs, to a large degree correlated with how complex they are, although not always. But the human genome, the human genome has six million. Si sorry, not six million, six billion. Six million would be disappointing. Even billion might be disappointing. Six billion base pairs. Six billion, six billion base pairs. And when you have your full complement of chromosomes, and this is in most of your, the cells in your body and outside of your, 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 your sex cells, your, your, the sperm or, or the egg cells, this is going to be spread over 46, 46 chromosomes. 40 six chromosomes, or I guess you'd say 23 pair of chromosomes. So if you divide six billion by 46, you get a little over, on average, 100 million, I think it's 100 and something million uh, base pairs per chromosome. And some chromosomes are longer, actually the, the, some of the longest are over 200 million, and some might be shorter. That's just on average. Now this number might, to some of you, might be exciting. You're like, oh, I, didn't, I thought I was a simple creature. I didn't know I was, I was this complex. Six billion, that's a lot of base pairs. That feels like a lot of information. For others of you, it, it, it might not feel so great. You might say, hey, wait, I could, I could store this much information on a, on a modern thumb drive or on a hard disk. I, I thought I was, I thought I was, I was more, more unique than that. And, and of course, we all are special and unique. But you might say, well, six billion base pairs. I thought I was, you know, I was infinitely complex and whatever else. And, and there's some arguments for that in, in, along some, some other directions. But this is uh, the, the, uh, the approximate length, I guess you could say, or the approximate size of the actual human genome. And when we talk about chromosomes, and we'll talk about chromosomes much in, in much more depth, depth, imagine taking this this zoomed in thing that you have right over here. And you know, over here, I don't know how many we have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. We have about twenty base pairs depicted here. Imagine if you had about two hundred million of these base pairs, and then you were to take this thing and you were to kind of coil it up into that thing is a, a is a chromosome is a chromosome and you're saying wait I have that much information in most of the cells of my body this thing must be incredibly compact packed and if you said that I would say yes you are correct this this the radius 
the radius of the DNA molecule is on the order of one nanometer. One nanometer, which is a billionth of a meter. So you can start to assess kind of the scale of this thing. This is a very dense way to actually store information. But just to have an appreciation of, and you might have seen it when I was coloring in, on, on why the structure lends itself to being able to replicate the information or even to be able to translate or express the information, let's think about if you were to take this ladder and you were to just kind of split all the base pairs. So you just have one half of them. So you essentially have half of the ladder. And so if you only have half of the ladder, you're able to construct the other half of the ladder. Let's, let's take an example. Let's say, and I'll just use the, the first letter to abbreviate for each of these bases. So let's say you have some, so let's say this is one of the, this is the sugar phosphate backbone right over here. So this could be one of the, one of the sides. And let's say there's some adenine, actually let me do them in the right color. So you've got some adenine, adenine, maybe some adenine right over here. Maybe there's an adenine there. Maybe you have some thymine, thymine. Maybe thymine right over here. Then you have some, you have some guanine, guanine, guanine. And then let's say you have some cytosine, and you have some cytosine. So if, with just half of the of this of of this ladder, I guess you could say, you're able to construct the other half. And that's actually how DNA replicates. This ladder splits, and then each of those two halves of that ladder are able to construct versions of the other half, or, or versions of the other half are able to be constructed on top of that on top of that half. So how does that happen? Well, it's based on how these bases pair. Adenine always pairs with thymine if we're talking about DNA. So if you have an A there, you're going to have a T on this end, a T on this end. T's right all over here, T right over there. If you have a T on that end, you're going to have an A right over there, A, A. If you have a G, a guanine on this side, you're going to have a cytosine on the other side. Cytosine, cytosine, cytosine. And if you have a cytosine, you're going to have a guanine on the other side. And so hopefully that gives you an appreciation of how DNA can replicate itself. And as we'll see also, how this information can be translated to other forms of either related molecules, but eventually to proteins. And just to kind of round out this video, to get a real visual sense of what the DNA molecule looks like, or I guess a different visual depiction from this, I found this, this animated that's animated GIF that, you know, if you haven't fully digested what a double helix looks like, this is it. And you see here, you see your sugar phosphate bases here. You see kind of the sugars and phosphate, uh, the sugars and the phosphates alternating along this backbone. And then the rungs of the ladder are these base pairs. So this is one of the bases. That's the corresponding, that's its corresponding, I guess you could say, partner. And you could see that along all the way up and down this molecule. Very exciting.